Hi, I'm Fred Trost, and we're going to talk about caribou hunting in this video. I'm here at our Outdoors Club Museum in Bath, Michigan, where we really focus a lot on white-tailed deer. So many of you are white-tailed deer hunters. These trophies to you represent something that uh, probably most of us will never even see in the woods during our lifetime. They're exciting animals to hunt, and they're extremely wary. They're much tougher than caribou. There's some differences between deer and caribou that you ought to realize before you go caribou hunting. One is the size, the physical size. Now I realize this is an albino deer, but it's about the size of a normal white tail. Only comes up not even waist high, weighs maybe 100, 125 pounds. It's a small target to shoot at compared to a caribou, much less meat, but these animals are more wary than caribou. The number one thing, and Maybe people will even tell you while you're caribou hunting about the nose on a caribou. They say, oh, they can smell you a mile away. Baloney, they can't. A white-tailed deer can't even smell you a mile away. In fact, can't smell you much more than 50 yards away under good conditions. Maybe 100 yards if conditions are ideal. But the nose of a white-tailed deer is the key to its scenting. And you notice it has the black nose pad. There's no hair on this. The deer licks its nose pad. The odor molecules are picked up there. And that's what gives the white-tailed deer such an extraordinary nose. Let's compare this with the nose on a caribou. It's covered with hair all over its nose, all over its muzzle. Now, what does this mean? Well, it doesn't lick its, the hair on its nose the way a deer uses its nose pad. So the nose on a caribou isn't nearly as important as it is to a deer. In fact, my experience has been, and you're going to see in the videos we show you, that a caribou's nose is I think virtually useless. I mean, it isn't just because of the way the caribou is built, but consider the conditions on the tundra. What you're going to see up there is a lot of wind, continuous wind. It whips over the hills and over the tundra, and it really isn't a concern to a caribou of smelling something because most of the time they're out in the open and they can see a wolf coming much farther away than they can smell it. So they're aware of the predators through their eyes. Now their eyes, are they very good? So, so. At a distance, you'll see in these videos that they're curious. They'll come up to you. If they're maybe 150 yards away, oftentimes they'll move in closer to get a look to see what you are. They're not particularly afraid of wolves and things like that because they stay in packs. Oh, of course, they are individually, and the wolves pick on the ones on the outside of the pack. But these, these animals travel in herds. What about the ears? Well, I told you that the wind whips over the tundra. And that absorbent tundra is very difficult to hear over. If you yell at a hunting buddy, it's liable to be absorbed and blown away by the wind. They have small ears, not particularly useful. The caribou survival is really dictated by staying in herds, staying in groups, and moving around through areas of danger that they encounter all the time. But look at the size of a caribou. Isn't this something else? I mean, this is up on a pedestal here in the museum, whole four inches off the ground or so. But still, you see it's much larger than a deer. This is a big bull caribou that was taken in Alaska. My first caribou experience came in Quebec, northern Quebec. Now, there's a couple places you've seen advertised, the Shefferville area and then farther north of that. We're going to go to an area north of Shefferville. I'll explain the problems with Shefferville hunting in well, not only the past few years, but the years ahead in a moment. But let's take off for northern Quebec, and this was my first experience. Okay, I took a bow. Oh, duh. I mean, really, a bow. If you're a bow hunter, you say, I want to shoot a caribou with a bow. Lots of problems involved with that. But let's get into the story right now, and then I'll be back to fill you in on some behind-the-scenes details. Ungava Bay is the famed caribou country in northern Quebec, Sometimes thousands cross rivers and lakes in massive herds during the fall migrations. The bulls are in velvet. They hardly notice the cold water rolling off their muscular backs as nature drives them to more favorable wintering grounds. We booked this hunt through Safari Nordique, flying from Montreal to Fort Chimo in the Ungava Range, then taking an otter 150 miles west to a remote camp. Although some of the country had small trees, most of it is quite barren. Tundra, land of caribou, ptarmigan, arctic fox, wolves, and Inuit Indians. And our hunting camp. The otter reverses the pitch on its prop so it can stop on the short makeshift landing strips on the tundra.
There are no roads up here, and we're going to be on our own for a week. Three tents make up our hunting camp, one for the guides and two for the hunters. This is luxury considering the location. Bow hunter Phil Grable from Lansing is in our party. Dave Borgeson, the assistant DNR fisheries chief, is also an avid bow hunter. Each morning we'd leave in boats to be dropped off to our hunting spots. And this, the first day, was the sunniest. But the sun never shows itself for very long. Dave Borgeson Jr. rounded out the party and the four of us, along with cameraman John Ford, set out the first week in September to fill our caribou tags with bows and arrows. The country is definitely far different than the northern United States. It's wide open and quiet, but intriguing. Small clumps of trees dotted the landscape here and there, but that's not where the caribou hide. There's really no place to hide in the tundra. It's quiet walking because of the spongy lichen that covers the rocky earth in northern Quebec. The caribou eat the lichen, and a few wandering bears eat the blueberries. And we found lots of them. And we probably would have spent more time picking and eating, but they were quite small. Needless to say, no blueberries made it back to camp. I tossed them right down the hatch. That's about it for the flora of the tundra. I suppose there's lots more than meets the eye, but there's not much we recognized. Compared to deer hunting, well, when you see a caribou track, there's no question about the size of these animals. They're big, and they leave big tracks. Seeing caribou is commonplace, and for deer hunters, oh, I tell you, it's exciting. Both sexes wear antlers, and the smallest headgear you see would be a prize on any one of our whitetail bucks. We saw caribou constantly, and oftentimes nearby, but always on far ridges. Unlike whitetail deer that head for the woods, caribou have to protect themselves from wolf packs, and they seem more confident in herds in the open where they can see a long distance too. I've never been to Africa, but from the pictures I've seen, it looked remarkably like the wild herds on the African plains. Like blueberry picking, we spent a short time fishing, casting spinners in the fast current by the rapids. If the fish were on the feed, we'd catch small Atlantic salmon. Dave Borgerson Jr. brings one to shore. They're beautiful fish. Dave Sr. prepared some poached in water. Oh, you can't believe the taste, and you can't believe the fight either. Oh, I tell you, that's why they jump like that, to throw the hook. Boy, they're incredible. Incredible. Right at the falls where we were fishing, a cow caribou and her calf plunged into the current, made a dash for the other shore. They're vulnerable in the water, but that's not how they're hunted, at least by man. Wolves keep an eye on the caribou crossings, though. We saw wolf tracks in the sand on the shores. They wait for caribou to cross, and if they get a chance, they'll take the calf. All this sunshine came on the first day followed the next day by rain all day. <laughs> we became well acquainted with Bert and John and Gordy from New England, rifle hunters who would undoubtedly get bigger trophies than us bow hunters, but we had a great time together. Wood is hard to come by in the tundra. It gave us precious warmth. Yeah, we had electricity as long as they kept flying in the gasoline. <laughs> After dinner, we'd swap a few stories, then hit the hay, because the days were long. Don't be fooled by the sun peeking through at daybreak. Ten minutes later, it can be raining, then the sun, then more rain. An hour's boat ride, and our guide, Al, drops John and I off by the same rapids we caught fish the day earlier. No fishing today, though. It's time to hunt caribou, an animal whose population has been growing in northern Quebec. It's excellent on the table. In fact, of all the venison I've had, I rank caribou at the top. 
I had this thought in mind the whole time I was hunting. With a bow, I wasn't counting on getting a trophy. I just wanted to get some good meat. My clothing, by the way, is made from Gore-Tex, the best rain-repellent wear I could find in Gore-Tex mittens. The temperature was close to freezing mornings and evenings. We spotted caribou as soon as we crawled up the riverbank. Two cows and a calf, a good sign the caribou were moving. In the next few days, I'd have moments of excitement. You'll see some of these next week. And the most exciting moment I've ever had while hunting, you'll see on this show two weeks from now. John Ford was right behind me with his camera. The record book bull was 40 yards ahead. My heart was pounding. Yours will too. Don't miss it. This one's coming this way. Mm -hmm.